Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Gentech Alliance for this webinar titled Molecular and Cellular Dynamics in Aortic Diseases, New Insights from Single-Cell Transcriptomic Studies. For this webinar, we will use the Q&A functionality built into Zoom to field any questions you may have for today's speakers. Please click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, and we'll cover as many as possible at the end of the session. I am honored to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Ying Shen is a professor at Baylor College of Medicine, where she serves as the director of the Aortic Disease Research Laboratory. Her research focuses on sporadic thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections, specifically understanding the molecular and cellular mechanisms of aortic degeneration that lead to aortic aneurysm, dissection, and rupture. The ultimate goal of her research is to develop pharmacological treatments to prevent progressive aortic destruction, maladaptive remodeling, and disease deterioration. Dr. Shen? Uh, thank you, Lauren, for the invitation and the very kind introduction. It's my honor to participate in this webinar and to give a very brief introduction of the topic. As we know, the progression of the aortic aneurysm and dissection is caused by aortic degeneration. That is characterized by progressive smooth muscle dysfunction and injury and the elastic fiber destruction, depletion, and aortic inflammation that leads to the weakening of the wall and the aortic aneurysm dissection and ultimately rupture. In the past decades, significant progress has been made in understanding the pathogenesis of aortic degeneration. However, many questions remain to be answered. The heterogeneity and the diversity of aortic cell populations in the diseased tissues is not completely understood. And the molecular and the cellular molecular mechanism and signaling pathways that trigger aortic degeneration and remain to be identified. Recent development of a single cell RNA sequencing technology allow us to analyze transcriptome for over 10,000 different cells at the single cell re resolution at the, in a single study. This provides us a powerful tool and a um, present opportunity to illustrate the complexity of aortic cell populations and that there are different type of transitions during disease progression and identify not only a single pathway, but also uh, regulatory networks that drive aortic degeneration. This technology also allows us to identify among uh, interactions and the communications among different types of cells that synergetically promote aortic injury. This massive information provides a high resolution roadmap and a clear picture of aortic uh, of the molecular and cellular process leading to aortic aneurysm that section the rupture. In this webinar, we'll discuss new knowledge regarding the molecular and cellular dynamics in aortic uh, disease that have been learned from recent single cell RNA sequencing uh, uh, analysis. We are pleased to have a two outstanding uh, physician scientists and uh, pioneers in this area of research to share, to present their exciting uh, new discoveries and to share their expertise in single cell studies. We greatly appreciate their generous support. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Shen. As a reminder, members of our audience can submit questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Our next speaker is Dr. Frank Davis, an assistant professor of vascular surgery in the Department of Surgery at the University of Michigan and section chief of vascular surgery at the Ann Arbor VA Healthcare System. His clinical interest and expertise focuses on the surgical and endovascular management of aortic aneurysms, aortoiliac occlusive disease, and cerebral vascular disease. In addition, he runs a translational scientific laboratory investigating the pathogenesis of abdominal aortic aneurysm development with an emphasis on epigenetic regulation of macrophage biology and vascular smooth cell dysfunction. His research pursuits are supported by the American Heart Association, American Surgical Association, and the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Davis? All right, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the, the uh, time and the opportunity to present here today. Uh, I'm just gonna take a brief moment and share my slides so we can all get this going. And 
All right. And I think everybody can now see the slide uh, slide deck that's up and running. Very good. Looks great. All right. Well, again, good morning. My, my name is Frank Davis from the University of Michigan, and I'm honored to present here at the Gentech Alliance on our work on um, abdominal aortic aneurysm research, as well as specifically looking at macrophage biology and epigenetic regulation of inflammation within aortic aneurysmal disease. Um, we specifically with our research have no financial disclosures related to this. So as many in this audience are aware of, but Abdominal aortic aneurysms represent the pathological dilation of the aorta, and currently, abdominal aortic aneurysms affect approximately 4 to 7% of the adult male population over the age of 65 and can predispose patients to the potential fatal consequence of aortic rupture. And despite advances in surgical therapy over the last two decades, there, in, in all honesty, remains an absence of a proven medical therapy to prevent aortic aneurysm progression and eventual rupture. Lessons learned from a combination of animal models and human tissue samples have revealed that abdominal aortic aneurysm is developed due to three primary pathological risk factors. These include patient-specific risk factors, including gender, age, smoking, and family history, inflammation within the aortic wall, as well as extracellular matrix degradation via proteolysis and smooth muscle cell apoptosis. Indeed, the lack of effective medical therapies to halt the development and progression of aortic aneurysms is associated with an inadequate understanding of how these mechanisms drive abdominal aortic aneurysm development and eventual progression. Recently, the advent of single cell RNA sequencing technology allows for the dissection of cellular populations within the aortic wall. Single cell sequencing adds unparalleled resolution to transcriptome studies, enabling a comprehensive investigation of a diverse array of cellular types within tissue in an unbiased fashion. It further provides the opportunity to assess the heterogeneity of gene expression in individual cell populations in both control and disease states, with a detailed characterization of cellular subpopulations. Indeed, understanding the heterogeneous, heterogeneous cell identities, diverse functional states, and subpopulations within abdominal aneurysms is fundamentally important in the etiology of aneurysmal disease as it allows us to better define cell-specific targets for early intervention. As such, for our work, the purpose of our study was to conduct single cell sequencing on the human abdominal aortic aneurysm tissues in order to uncover novel pathological pathways for aneurysm development. Specifically, we sought to examine the transcriptional landscape of human abdominal aortic aneurysms to determine cellular alterations during abdominal aortic aneurysm pathogenesis. For our study, in order to analyze this, we collected fresh aortic tissue samples at the time of open aortic aneurysm repairs, as well as repairs of patients who underwent non-aneurysmal surgery, and we isolated six human abdominal aneurysm patients and six non-aneurysmal control samples. And these patients ranged in age from 55 to 75 and had relatively equivalent cardiovascular comorbidities. For a single cell association after cells underwent processing, we had a total of 50,290 cells that passed our quality controls and were then analyzed by Surratt in an unsupervised clusterizing fashion. Using single cell RNA sequencing, we were able to arrange cellular populations composing the aorta into unique clusters using mechanical marker gene analysis as well as ontology analysis. We initially identified 17 subclusters, and after conserving genes within these clusters, we identified eight major cell populations within the aortic wall. As expected, these cell clusters comprise structural components of the aortic wall, including smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells, but they also demonstrate an inflammatory component including B cells, T cells, and most notably monocytes macrophages or myeloid cells. Given the complete detection of varying cell types in the aortic wall, we then went on to compare aortic cellular composition between both control and abdominal aortic aneurysm samples. This demonstrated that control tissues contributed more cells than expected to the non-immune cell group, including fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and smooth muscle cells. Whereas the aneurysm tissues contributed more cells than expected to immune cell populations, B cells, T cells, and especially monocytes and macrophages. This thereby suggests a strong inflammatory infiltration within the aortic wall during abdominal aortic aneurysm development. Next, within single cell sequencing, it also provides a novel opportunity to identify cell cell crosstalk within a given disease state based upon the expression of cellular surface receptors and their associated interacting ligands. Specifically within our study to learn about cell-cell communication, we performed cell phone DB ligand receptor analysis. And for this technique, cells are analyzed by transcriptomics to measure expression of genes within given cellular populations. The data are then used to generate and pre-process and build gene expression matrices as shown the ones here, which organizes the genes and their expression profile based upon each individual cell. 
associated with these gene expression matrix, we then integrate into um, that matrix an interacting protein expression analysis that integrates with the single cell data. These specific protein expression analysis identifies both receptors and ligands within the gene expression matrix. Ultimately, we only are so interested in analyzing the interacting proteins that are held within the gene expression matrix, both in the receptor and ligand. The expression levels of these receptor and ligands across different cellular populations then allows us to compute a computational score for each ligand receptor pair across different cell types. In essence, we can determine the cell-cell communication that's altered within the disease state. So using our single cell data in association, with, in association with cell phone DB ligand receptor analysis, we then are able to create circle plots that allow for the identification of crosstalk between cellular populations within the aortic wall. And shown here is a circle plot for the control aortic tissue. And as you can see, within control aortic tissue, there are interactions between multiple cellular populations within the aortic wall. However, there's relatively limited interactions between the macrophage or myeloid population and the smooth muscle cell population within the control aortic wall. In contrast, when we present the circle plot for the abdominal aortic aneurysms, you can see there's upregulation of multiple crosstalks within cellular populations, as well as a significant upregulation of crosstalk between the macrophage population and smooth muscle cell population within the aortic wall. And it's because of these increase in cell-cell crosstalk between smooth muscle cells, as well as the macrophage population that we feel inflammation, especially macrophage media inf mediated inflammation, is an important driver of abdominal aortic aneurysm development. Now, macrophages are a highly plastic cell that are capable of adapting a range of phenotypes depending upon their different uh, cellular population and phenotypic expression. And typically within normal macrophage inflammation within vascular disease, they initially present in a pro-inflammatory state characterized by the phagocytosis debris and indeed the release of inflammatory cytokines. And then during the course of inflammation, these macrophages should transition to an anti-inflammatory state, characterized by the use of anti-inflammatory cytokines as well as other growth factors. However, with an abdominal organism, this transition fails to occur. Instead, macrophages persist in a chronic inflammatory state for which the mechanism remains undefined. And overall, it's the goal of our laboratory to better elucidate the mechanisms behind how abdominal organism macrophages remain in the state of chronic inflammation. And as such, we return to our single cell sequencing, but this time specifically analyzing the monocyte macrophage population within abdominal organisms and non aneurysmal controls. Specifically, we identified differential gene expression analysis within that monocyte macrophage population, and then conducted gene ontology analysis of those differentially expressed genes. Shown here are the upregulated pathways within uh, macrophages from abdominal organisms in comparison to non aneurysm controls. And as you can see by gene ontology analysis, there is a marked upregulation of a number of pro-inflammatory pathways, including T-cell co-stimulation, interferon gamma activation, as well as NF-kappa B transcription factor activity. In contrast, there's a down-regulation of the anti-inflammatory pathways within the macrophage population, as shown here by these pathways. And given this difference in pathway activation between abdominal organisms and macrophages and non aneurysm controls, we sought to determine what might be driving that upregulation in pro-inflammatory pathways. And one avenue for the regulation of macrophage phenotype is epigenetic modification. And typically within its natural state, DNA is bound tightly to histones in order to allow for the packaging of the genome. Modifications of these histones, most notably methylation, can lead to either the unwinding of DNA resulting in genes being turned on, or can lead to the further condensation of DNA resulting in genes being turned off. Given that epigenetic modifications can be regulated by cardiovascular as well as environmental risk factors, we hypothesize that epigenetic modifications within macrophages drive inflammation and aortic wall degradation during abdominal aneurysm development. So as such, to further explore this potential role of epigenetic modifications within macrophages driving that inflammation, we then conducted a analysis of all known epigenetic enzymes within our single cell sequencing population, but specifically isolating alterations in epigenetic enzymes within the monocyte macrophage population. And one epigenetic enzyme that we found that was notably upregulated within macrophages from abdominal organisms was the enzyme JMJD3. Now, many in the audience might be wondering, well, what exactly is JMJD3? Well, JMJD3 is an epigenetic enzyme that specifically removes methyl groups from histone 3 lysine 27, and as such is a histone demethylase. 
And shown here, when histone 3 lysine 27 is trimethylated, this results in the condensation of DNA around chromatin and thereby turns gene transcription off as promoters or excuse me, transcription factors are unable to bind to promoters. However, when JMJD3 is present, this removes the methyl groups from histone 3 lysine 27, thereby allowing promoters to be exposed and ultimately gene expression to be turned on. In essence, JMJD3 removes that repressive mark on gene transcription. So as such, we went on to analyze JMJD3 expression across all cellular populations within both control and abdominal aortic aneurysm tissue samples. And as you can see in this dot plot here, JMJD3 expression was shown with the size of the dot corresponding to the percent of cells expressing JMJD3 and the color of the dot corresponding to the average fold expression of JMJD3 within those given cells. And as you can see, JMJD3 is most profoundly expressed in the monocyte macrophage population, as well as significantly elevated in monocyte macrophages isolated from abdominal aortic aneurysms in comparison to non aneurysm controlled tissues. We also went on to further understand, well, what are the differentiated pathways that are activated in those cells that are expressing JMJD3 versus those that are not? And as such, we conducted both a gene ontology analysis and a keg pathway analysis of JMJD3 positive versus JMJD3 negative cells. And there's also that are shown here. And as you can see, those cells that are expressing JMJD3, again, have a substantial activation of multiple pro-inflammatory pathways. IL-1 betas, cellular response is up, toll-like receptor signaling is up, as well as a positive macrophage and migration is up, thereby suggesting that JMJD3 activation may be linked to why we see this upregulation in macrophage pro-inflammatory state. We also looked at specific heat maps of different gene expressions um, within JMJD3 positive cells as compared to JMJD3 negative cells. And these are specifically cytokine-based signaling pathway heat maps. And again, multiple inflammatory cytokines are upregulated in those cells that are expressing JMJD3. So next, to further improve our analysis of the hypothetical development relationship that might exist in terms of monocyte macrophage population, as well as the activation of JMJD3, we then went on to conduct a trajectory analysis, which can be a useful tool in single cell sequencing analysis. And specifically for this trajectory analysis, we analyzed the macrophage population, but also monocyte clusters one through three. And within the trajectory analysis, we found that there's specifically three unique branch points. And indeed, we found that monocyte cluster one was at the beginning of this trajectory analysis, and then proceeded down with monocyte cluster two, three, and the macrophage cluster later along in the trajectory. Interestingly, we found that as these clusters progressed along the trajectory analysis, you had an upregulation of inflammatory cytokines but there was also a notable upregulation of JMJD3, again suggesting that there's parallel upregulation of JMJD3 activation and inflammatory cytokine nature of the myeloid cells within aneurysmal disease. And I think ultimately, although single cell sequencing is a very useful technique to identify gene expression analysis in different cellular populations, there's also you ultimately have to do confirmatory testing and confirmatory analysis. So for our study, we specifically analyzed the histological architecture of the aortic wall specifically looking at protein expression of JMJD3 within the aneurysm walls in comparison to non aneurysmal control samples. And shown here is histological staining of the aortic aneurysm with JMJD3 in red and myeloid cells in green. And as you can see in the control population, there's none of that expressed. Whereas in contrast, in the aortic aneurysm, there's significant upregulation of myeloid cell and JMJD3 staining, as well as overlap, as noted by the yellow architecture. So next, given the increase in JMJD3 expression within the human abdominal aortic aneurysm tissue samples, we sought to better understand what are the potential mechanisms that are driving JMJD3 as well as its role within macrophage inflammation. So as such, we turned to our mirroring model of aneurysmal disease. And within our mirroring model of aneurysmal disease, we specifically in our lab use the angiotensin II induced abdominal aortic aneurysm model. And this model mirrors human pathology of aneurysmal disease and it involves mice that are hypercholesterolemic, as well as implantation of osmotic pump that infuses either angiotensin II or saline in order to produce hypertension. And indeed, the combined effects of the hypercholesterolemia and the hypertension will produce a notable abdominal aortic aneurysm dilation shown here on ex vivo analysis, as well as in vivo ultrasound measurements. And using this model, we sought to better investigate the mechanistic role JMJD3 may play in the abdominal aortic aneurysm development. So first, we isolated macrophages from angiotensin II-induced abdominal aneurysm samples 
as well as salient control, and first started off by analyzing JMJ83 specific expression. And indeed, we found in the myelin cell population there was significant upregulation of JMJ83 within the ANG2 induced abdominal organism samples. This was can parallel what we see within our human patient populations. In addition, we also analyzed a number of different pro inflammatory cytokines in the monocyte macrophage population of the ANG2 induced abdominal organism samples. And indeed, consistent with what we see with our patient populations, there's marked activation of multiple inflammatory cytokine signalings within the macrophages from angiotensin II induced abdominal organism samples. And as I've previously mentioned, JMJ83 is an epigenetic enzyme that removes methyl groups from histone 3 lysine 27 and thereby activates gene expression. And as such, in order to determine if JMJ83 may be driving this pro inflammatory state seen within the macrophages, we conducted chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments and analyzed that mark of H3K27 on multiple different pro inflammatory cytokine gene promoters. And indeed, we found in the angiotensin II induced monocyte macrophage population, there was a decrease in H3K27 trimethylation mark on the inflammatory cytokine promoters. Taken together, these results suggest that JMJ83 may be a driving factor between why there's this increase in inflammatory signaling within the monocyte macrophage population. Next, given that JMJ83 is profoundly elevated in both our human tissue samples and our animal model, we sought to determine if we could intervene on this pathway and thereby prevent aortic aneurysmal disease. As such, we randomized mice to either injection of a PBS control or injection of GSKJ4, which is a small molecule drug inhibitor of JMJ83. After this, mice were then randomized to um, infusion of either angiotensin II or saline, and we monitored for the course of abdominal organism development over 28 days. And what we found is at the end of 28 days, as expected, those mice that received the angiotensin II plus the PBS group displayed a marked dilation of their inframural abdominal aorta. However, those mice that received the angiotensin II plus injection of the small molecule drug inhibitor of JMJ3, specifically entitled GSKJ4, they were protected from aneurysmal disease. Indeed, they had a decreased abdominal organism diameter as well as a decrease in abdominal organism rupture. Moving on, we also sought to determine if, well, this, did this impact inflammation within the macrophage population? As such, we analyzed a number of different pro-inflammatory cytokines with IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha being representative ones shown here. And indeed, we found that when we injected GSKJ4 into these mice, we not only prevented aneurysms, but also decreased abdominal organism macrophage inflammation by cytokine expression. We also conducted parallel chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments and found that when GSKJ4 was injected, we have had a reciprocal increase in that H3K27 trimethylation mark on gene promoters. This thereby suggests that inhibition of JMJ83 turns off inflammatory cytokine expression within the macrophages as they are unable to remove that repressive H3K27 trimethylation mark on gene promoters. Next, we wanted to get more self-specific in our experiments. And since global pharmacological inhibition of JMJ83 prevented aortic aneurysms, we wanted to specifically analyze if macrophage-specific inhibition of JMJ83 was able to prevent aortic aneurysmal disease. And as such, we created a mouse that had a myeloid-specific deletion of JMJ83 and randomized this mouse to either saline or angiotensin II injection. And indeed, we found that those mice that had a wild-type copy of JMJ83 as expected, had a dilation of their abdominal aorta. However, those mice that had a myeloid-specific deletion of JMJ83 were protected from aortic aneurysmal disease, as denoted by a decrease in abdominal aortic aneurysm diameter, as well as the risk of rupture. Also within this genetic mirroring model, we analyzed macrophage-mediated expression of inflammatory cytokines. Indeed, shown here, we found that in mice that had a myeloid-specific deletion of JMJ83, there was a marked decrease in IL-1 beta inflammation as seen from the macrophage expression. And this was seen both at the RNA level shown in this bar graph here, as well as at the protein level, which is demonstrated here by flow cytometry. So in summary, using both our human tissue samples and our mirroring model, we demonstrate that at least within normal aortic tissue, there's overall low level expression of the epigenetic enzyme JMJ3. And as such, macrophages have an increased level of this repressive H3K27 trimethylation mark that overall turns off inflammation within macrophages. However, within abdominal aortic aneurysms, we note that there's increased expression of JMJ83 within the macrophage subpopulation. 
And this thereby removes the repressive H3K27 trimethylation mark from inflammatory cytokine promoters, thereby turns on inflammation within macrophages. We feel that this enzyme is likely a mediator of inflammation and the detrimental aortic breakdown that leads to abdominal orgasm development and eventual rupture. So in conclusion, at least within our study, the application of single cell sequencing in the field of aortic aneurysms has allowed to characterize the cellular heterogeneity of the aortic wall, as well as especially characterize different cellular populations, specifically for our studies, the monocyte macrophage phenotype within aortic aneurysmal disease. And indeed, by combining both human aortic tissue sample studies, as well as investigational mirroring models, we identified that the epigenetic enzyme JMJ3 likely regulates macrophage-mediated inflammation within aneurysmal disease. And currently, we are moving on to different aomic-based techniques, specifically spatial transcriptomics and attack sequencing, to further complement our single-cell sequencing data to allow for a better mechanistic understanding of the pathways that lead to aneurysm uh, disease progression and eventual rupture. So overall, I'd like to thank the number of authors involved in this study, as well as the funding sources, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about either our single-cell sequencing techniques and our experimentation or our mirroring studies. Um, so thank you for your time, and I'll stop sharing my screen at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. I already see some questions coming in. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to answer those now or wait till the end, or how, how would you um, regret? We're going to do the Q&A at the end. Uh, okay, you're welcome fine. to you're welcome to type in the responses if if you'd like or or we can answer them live. I, I'll answer them live at the end. I'll I'll Dr. Lindsay to get his great talk as always. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Our our final speaker is Dr. Mark Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay is a member of the Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiology Divisions at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Clinically, Dr. Lindsay is Director of the Cardiovascular Genetics Program in the Division of Cardiology at MGH. He performs genetic evaluations and provides ongoing care for children and adult patients with genetically triggered vascular disease. Dr. Lindsay is a member of the staff of the Cardiovascular Research Center at MGH, researching human vascular disease focusing on genetic and pathophysiologic mechanisms of aneurysms, dissections, and stenoses. He is a member of the Professional Advisory Board of the Markman Foundation. Dr. Lindsay? Thanks. Um, share. Share. You guys see a screen? Looks great. All right. Thanks again for the invitation. And always happy to talk about our work. Um, that was really such an interesting talk. I, I hadn't got to see Dr. Davis go through his work before instead of just reading the literature. And that's that's a very active site on H3, mm -hmm. um, which we can talk about more. But uh, I'm going to take you through some different work um, that we've been doing. First, to, to tell you, you know, how we've been thinking about single cell RNA or single nuclear RNA sequencing and how we can use it to decipher some of the other work we're doing and also to learn a little bit about the biology. And of course, I, I primarily work uh, in the thorax and, oh, I should say my disclosures. Um, I have research funding from angiobiotherapeutics, but uh, it's not related to today. So yeah, I, I primarily work in the, in, in the ascending uh, aorta where, where I do most of the thinking about um, aneurysmal disease. And that's primarily because most of the, the conditions I, I deal with clinically are hereditary aortopathies. And so these are, you know, classically Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue conditions like Lewy's Dietz syndrome or non-syndromic familial thoracic aortic disease. And, you know, this is, this, this is uh, important and obviously important to the patients and the families with these conditions. But when we think about you know, the broad range of aortic dissections, especially type A aortic dissections. And we, we look in, you know, a study like IRAD, you know, of all the aortic dissections out there, Marfan syndrome is a pretty small percentage and, and dropping as we, as we have better care and, and prophylactic surgery for patients. And, and even, you know, Men, even Mendelian um, conditions as a whole in thoracic aortic diseases is a small um, you know, percentage of the, of the whole. So there, there's a big part of aortic disease 
that is sporadic in nature. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about more today um, because it's been the focus of our single cell work uh, so far. We know that you know aortic diameter um, is really, as of yet, our best biomarker for aortic dissection risk. And that, that's true whether you're in the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, this is the work of Jun Boon Kim, uh, who came to visit us for the time um, a while back now. And or ascending aortic aneurysm. Really, your your risk of aortic dissection or aortic failure is proportional to the aortic diameter. You know, and with that in mind, um, with the collaboration of Patrick Eleanor and and the work mostly of James Spiricello, we undertook, um, you know, trying to learn more about the genetics of aortic diameter. So we took advantage of the UK Biobank and, and um, specifically the imaging cohort in the UK Biobank that had released about 45,000 um, CINI MRAs uh, at the time of this study, where you can get a nice look at the ascending aorta and the descending aorta. And James um, deployed, you know, oh, sorry, this is a, a CINI. So this is the, the quality of data that, that's in the UK Biobank. So James wanted to measure these um, aortic diameters because these patients had been genotyped. And he um, ended up deploying after um, some different trials, a computer vision technology that, that um, can undertake deep learning of different structures within the thorax. And he was able to train the model with a pretty limited um, number of training uh, examples about a little over a hundred to you know accurately find and recognize the ascending and descending aorta, and then put measurements on them. And so we were able to get you know high quality um, diameter measurements of the ascending and descending aorta throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, and then after developing that model, he deployed it against a little um, under four million images all through the cardiac cycle. And able to you know to extract aortic diameters for about forty thousand people. So, from that data, that this is this is what that data looks like, which I always like to show because I think it's super interesting. Which is that, you know, it, it's kind of like what you had imagined as a clinician. There's a lower limit of size of the aorta. <laughs> Men's aortas are bigger than women's, and there's a long rightward tail because, of course, there are aneurysms hiding even in the general population. Um, so, and then of course the descending aortic diameter at the level of the right pulmonary artery, smaller than the ascending, of course, because you've lost the blood flow to the head and arms. So using this uh, aortic diameter as a, as a continuous variable, um, we used it across the genotyping in the UK bio, biobank um, to perform a GWAS study. And we're able to identify, you know, a lot of new uh, loci associated with thoracic aortic diameter. Um, you know, some of them were overlapping um, with each other, but many more for the um, ascending aortic uh, diameter, which makes sense. It's really the anatomy with the highest heritability. Uh, the and you know, reassuringly, just from a GWAS that was just measuring aortic diameter, we were actually able to identify all the known um, aortic dissection GWAS loci. So, you know, when you when you do a, what's essentially a biomarker GWAS, you 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 want to be sure that it's actually you know following the clinical outcome. So it's it's nice to see that the aortic di known aortic dissection GWAS loci were also identified by this technique. And then if you, you calculate a polygenic risk score, you can identify um, incident thoracic aortic surgery in um, all the pa patients who did not have imaging. So this is, you know, of people who were not in the, in the original imaging cohort and the rest of the biobank. If you had the top, if you're in the top 10 percentile of the PRS score, you're much more likely to have a thoracic aortic surgery, you know, within the next several years after you're genotyped. So 
now you're left trying to, oh, and I, I should say, you know, this also gives, gives us, you know, more broadly uh, a look at the aortic biology from things that we've known about for a long time, like the extracellular matrix involvement to extracellular matrix BSMC junctions, contraction, um, phenotype switching. And we got JMJ D1C, which <laughs> maybe Dr. <laughs> Davis can tell us um, a little bit more about. I, I couldn't find a lot on it when trying to, yeah. to read about. Um, but, but you know, epigenetic signaling is important, obviously, in, in the ascending aorta, just like it is in the abdominal aorta. Um, we did do our first um, single nuclear sequencing um, you know, experiment back in this study. And the reason we had done it was because we had actually collected um, ascending and descending aortic tissue from three patients at, at, a, at we have a, a rapid autopsy uh, protocol at, at MGH. And we applied the, the TWAS data, transcriptional wide, excuse me, um, association study data with just the idea that we wanted to see whether the, the the genes that were being identified by TWAS would localize to the VSMC compartment, which is the culprit compartment and ascending aneurysm. And you know, to, to some extent, it did. You know, in we in these clusters, VSMC one and VSMC two. But the you know this was a start, but it didn't really get us to where you know where we wanted to both understand the biology. Um, and 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 also to help us like look through the GWAS loci and try to direct us to the causal genes within those loci. So we're going to spend the rest of the time um, describing a, a larger experiment that we performed um, doing singular nuclear RNA sequencing. And this is the work of uh, Liz Chow from my lab uh, and Mark Chafin and Bridget Simonson, who were at the Broad Institute. Um, this is kind of the the overview, and I'll I'll take this um, time to sort of describe the difference between um, single cell and single nuclear sequencing. So we use single nuclear sequencing um, for a couple reasons. One is because uh, it, it's convenient, um, and and the reason for that is some of our samples were quite old. They had been um, in the freezer, you know, frozen at the time of surgery. Uh, but in the freezer for some time. And so we were not um, sanguine about having viable cells. And, and then the other um, reason is, is that it, it the aorta is a very tough tissue and it's really hard to get smooth muscle cells uh, intact uh, out to work on. And I, I, I most of my career has been um, finding that over and over again whenever I trying to isolate cells from between elastin and lamella, it, it's very difficult. Um, so so we, we chose to do um, single nuclear sequencing. You lose some data, obviously you're losing the cytoplasmic uh, RNAs, um, but I think you can still gain some insights. This is the demographics of our patients. I just wanted to show this um, briefly. We had six ascending aortic um, samples, and this is this was post-processing, you know, many samples failed um, QC just before, you just couldn't recover any usable data and seven control uh, samples. You know, the, these were all sporadics with, you know, aor ascending aortic diameters between 4.6 and six centimeters, whereas the controls were in the twos and threes in terms of centimeters. So, um, you know, mostly middle age, um, patients and we were able to to get these were the samples after processing that we were able to get informative nuclei and sequence. Oops, sorry. So we ended up with about 71,000 nuclei from these 13 samples. Um, we performed clustering, which I'll, I'll show in a second. I, I wanted to show because I know UMAP has, has been getting a a bad rap lately. But I think it's still a, a very useful way of looking at, at cells if you don't overinterpret things. But if you want to look at, at the principal component analysis, they're all in the, in the um, supplement. 
But this is just the first, I think it was so nice that the first four principal components were able to differentiate um, aneurysms from controls really quite nicely in clusters, regardless of sex. And then we're, the sec second two were able to differentiate men and women um, regardless of aneurysm status. And I thought that was uh, nice. So to move on to actual clustering, we did unsupervised clustering. Uh, we ended up with 14 um, cell types um, with three major smooth muscle groups. If you look at the numbers, the VSMC1, which is shown in red here, is about 90% of the nuclei. VSMC2s are about 10% uh, or so, and then a small group of VSMC3s, which actually ended up being contributed from primarily from one sample. If there's time at the end, I can talk about that. Um, you know, when you compare them with, with the classic, these, these VSMC populations with sort of the classic ways we think about contractile and proliferative smooth muscles, you know, some, some of them, they, they kind of behave like that. The ACTA2, MYH11 certainly show, uh, you know, somewhat of a gradient from, from the most common to the less. Um, but for sure, or a VSMC3 can't really be a culprit cell class because it was only in one sample <laughs> primarily. Um, and the other things like well-known proteins like smooth lens, and, you know, didn't show that same behavior that we see in, in animal models. And when we looked across the populations, there, there really weren't large shifts in, in the number of cells, you know, that they, 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 you could get, there was a statistically significant larger number of VSMC1 um, percentage, but, but you know, nothing really remarkable. And, you know, just to, to point out from the last talk from Dr. Davis's talk, you know, inflammation is not a big part of ascending thoracic aneurysm. And you can see down here in the, in the immune uh, part, we actually had more macrophagian controls. It just points out the, the difference in biology between the two. You know, this is, I, I wanted to point out, this is Alpadroza's um, great study in mice. And this is what I expected to find, you know, was that you know, this is the group from Stanford uh, in Marfan mice. They've done a, a lot of really excellent single cell work. And, you know, they were able to identify a, a novel cell class and they named this modified smooth muscle cells or MODS SMCs. And they they had a lot of the kind of anticipated biologic um, you know, characteristics that we thought it, that we think about before single cell sequencing technology, you know, that they didn't have as many of the contractile elements. It's the blue. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but it's the blue here. Um, and you know they express more fibronectin or elastin, so they're so they're more reactive. This, this actually matched what you know and what we have been seeing in sort of you know old school histology <laughs> for some time, sort of in the Marfan animal models. You know that contractile proteins go down, and um, and we think that there's novel cellular classes, but we just didn't see that in in these, and I, I think it. It relates to the, the disease that, that this is just a different disease. This is sporadic TAA in middle age. Um, sorry, it's skipping for some reason. Um, this is so we, we actually went and looked for though um, as as much as we could to see if we could find um, those novel cell classes. And if you if you look, you know. Our cell classes versus um, the data sets that we could uh, examine, both from uh, the Lee paper um, and then the three papers from the Stanford group in mice and people. Um, we really didn't see in the smooth muscle compartment much correlation between our VSMC, our, our three VSMC groups, and you know mod the modulated SMCs or um, fibromyocytes was, a, was an earlier name that the, the group had given, given these cells. So, you know, it's just, um, in, our, in our minds, it, it's just different and, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not, ours are not there. Um, those cells are not there in our um, model. We even tried to 
subset VSMCs because the VSMCs were 60% of our cell mass, something like that. So, you know, and we presented our, our stepwise approach to subclustering and ended up with seven um, different VSMC subclusters that could, you know, had um, different uh, gene set enrichment and, and pathway enrichment. And you know that there, there's some minor changes, but really when you map these also on on um, modified SMCs or or those cells, they they don't really match either. Um, so so we really don't see a big shift in cell class. That's that's what one of the conclusions of, of our study. But they're really quite similar between aneurysmal aortas and and controls. We saw in the fibroblast group, there was certainly a signal for disappearance, you see here in blue, of this um, class of fibroblasts. And this is, um, you can see on the UMAP, that's the, the blue is all by itself in the controls and all the fibroblasts are up in the other um, cell classes. And so really there's kind of a disappearance of, of this S1 group. These are, when we compared fibroblast subsets, these are what have been described as quiescent fibroblasts, or just the, the fibroblasts are just kind of chilling out and, and have low metabolic activity, which makes a lot of sense. They, this, is, this is a known um, phenotype for the adventitia and for you know diseases like hypertension that have a reactive adventitia. We, we tried to find some of the, you know, there's been some really neat work in aneurysm on, on um, adventitial signaling and, and shifts between um, fibroblasts and BSMCs. We couldn't really uh, find that in our data. Not that that's not real. It's just that I think mice have dramatic phenotypes sometimes compared to, to people. Um, and uh, so, so, I think there's a lot still to be done in, in aortic fibroblasts, and we were able to confirm this in, in RNA scope. Yeah. So just in the final part, I just wanted to talk about, so we went back to really define um, some of the changes within the cell groups, since we didn't really see novel cell groups. And these are the... Uh, volcano maps of, of the genes that we had really high confidence that were differentially expressed. When you look across the VSMC classes, uh, VSMC1 and 2, um, again, VSMC1 was like 90% of the smooth muscle cells. And there, there are some differentially expressed genes. Um, the real action was in the VSMC2 group. And you see really some, um, there was actually like 130 genes or so that were differentially expressed, but some kind of famous ones like LMO7, osteopontin, calmodulin, LTBB1, TFB2, uh, which has been shown not only in, in sporadic aneurysm, but in syndromic aneurysm to be upregulated. And HDAC9, which I was happy to see because I had seen that before, and now we have secondary confirmation. Um, and so we wanted to see whether these gene expression changes could help us understand some of our GWAS data. And so we did this experiment, which I'll just take you through. But basically, we took the high confidence DGs. There were about 300 and some odd um, that passed all the, the uh, 334 that passed all the um, requirements. Sorry. Um, and then we looked for all the genes within 500 KB of the locus, 250 on either side. And then we used a, a bioinformatic algorithm called POPS that, that integrates epigenetic data and mapping data. Um, and you know, we're able to reduce the number of, of DEGs at these loci and focused down on, we actually pulled out um, eight genes that, that we believe are driving the heredity of these loci. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, they, 
actually kind of makes sense. So for instance, um, you know, some of these are super well known, right? LRP1, for instance. And when you look across the cell types, you know, it's macrophage, which, which is, you know, the LRP1 function and macrophage has is, is been pretty well characterized, as has its role in smooth muscle. I mean, it's still present in, in smooth muscle. Um, LTBP4, alpha actinin 4, which is um, special among the actinins because it, it's a mechanosensing actinin. Um, good old June, um, which uh, binds MAD2 and, you know, has important roles in TGF beta signaling. So, um, you know, I think this is a, an example of how you can use um, RNA sequencing to prioritize uh, GWAS loci. And then finally, just the last, um, last little comment is you can also, you know, we're now taking a step through and trying to prioritize, um, you know, likely therapeutic targets. So if you look at some of the, the high likelihood genes that we identified um, in the GWAS study, you know, there's supervillain, SVIL, ASB2, WWP2. And you can now use, now that we have these data, you can map on their expression and you say, well, I want to design a therapeutic. Um, I want to give it to people, but I don't want to hit off target. So what I really want is to have enriched smooth muscle expression and not a lot of expression in, you know, the immune, everywhere else. And basically, you know, supervillain was the number one gene we pulled out, but it it's everywhere. Like you don't want you don't want to mess with it. it is, it's in every cell in the body. Um, but ASB, ASB2, WWP2, you know, they looked they were pretty vascular enriched. So better, better candidates for either pharmacologic or gene therapeutic um, targeting. So that's another way you can use single cell data um, to really think your way through um, therapeutic development. So just finally, you know, um, from this study, I think it it shows that the biology is different um, between sporadic, you know, aortic aneurysm and syndromic aneurysm. And I think Dr. Shen would come; you, she wouldn't be surprised by this. You know, I, I think by the time you're middle age, your your aorta's been growing very slowly. You know, it, it's not a dramatic process. It's been chugging along for for you know half a century before <laughs> you show up. Um, and and we see instead of new cell classes, just just um, differences in gene expression within those known cell classes, um, and that we can use this kind of technology to prioritize other genetic findings. So thanks a lot. And, um, I I um, already thanked uh, most of the folks um, that had done this work, but especially my collaborator Patrick Eleanor, who's also my boss. Um, and then the folks who actually did the work, uh, Liz Chow, Mark Chafin, and Bridget Simonson, and um, James Pierchello, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay. Very much appreciated. I would like to thank all of our speakers, Dr. Ying Shen, Frank Davis, and Mark Lindsay for their excellent presentations. Members of our audience have submitted several questions for our speakers, and we'll go through those now. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, please address the N that is acceptable for a study, differentiating pooled N from biological replicate N. Who'd like to take this one? I, I can go ahead and chime in. I mean, I, yeah, I think th this is this is a very, uh, I guess, hot topic and, and difficult topic in single cell sequencing and single nuclear sequencing that Dr. Lindsay brought up in his study. I think Ideally, more N is better. Let's just be honest. But uh, um, we're limited in terms of the resources, and both financial from within individual labs, as well as within um, patient samples, especially that I find within my research is your control tissue. Um, people don't want to give up their normal healthy aorta. It's just a natural, a natural thing. Um, so I, 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 there's not good um, answer to your question of terms of the number of N that you would need to have meaningful aspects. It's more based upon the number of cells you're getting within each of things with each given single cell sequencing data set. And I think that's the more pivotal aspect of the study. Um, Dr. Lynn, did you want to chime in in terms of what you had your aspect on that? Yeah. I mean, the, the 10X kit gives you 16 or something. <laughs> so, 
yeah. it, it, it's it's usually a resource like you said it's a control number of control decision and and then the resource because it, it they're just super expensive experiments um yeah. i i think you you know i think both of our studies that were presented here had about the same number of cells or nuclei that came out the other end with similar number of patient samples we were able to make good observations with high statistical significance so you know i think I don't know the answer to the question, but I know that this many works. Yeah. If you had twice as many, you could probably get twice as many high confidence differential expression genes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Dr. Shen, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I agree. More is better, but the cost is issue. We have done uh, now over 50 uh, patient samples and probably uh, over 10 controls. And overall, even like compared with, with our early study, we only have a few samples. The overall pattern is pretty similar. And uh, we do, like, of course, more sample give us more confidence of our finding. Dr. Thank Shen, that's you. great to hear the, num the number you've done. I mean, um, that's quite high. And I think uh, that starts, I know, at least within my initial study, we've been adding on, and I think in probably Dr. Lindsay's initial study, the, the one aspect of sex as a biological variable, we weren't, at least in my study, I wasn't powered enough to detect any differences of that. But once you start getting into the numbers you're talking about, hopefully you can start to tease some of that out as you dive in deep, deeper with the data. So that's exciting, hopefully coming down the pipeline soon. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next question we have, single cell or single nucleus for aortic tissues? I think I already gave my um, reason um, for, for our decision during the talk, so I'll leave that alone. Okay. Yeah, and I think from, from my standpoint, it was just, just we chose to do single cell sequencing. I don't think, I think at the end of the day, you're getting, there's positive and negative to each different um processing tissue, whether it's single cell and for live cells and you get the cytoplasmic versus batch correction that you can do with single nuclear aspects and being able to have multiple samples that you process at the similar time. So I think it's more of a you, you, um, feasibility within your given lab setup. Okay. Um, this came in after uh, Dr. Lindsay's talk. Did you look into the gene expression profile of every individual <laughs> immune cell subsets? I'm wondering whether the type of inflammation is different between control and aneurysm. I mean, we looked at differential expression, um, gene differential expression in like the macrophage population because um, the T cells and B cells are vanishingly rare. It's like, there just aren't, there's just not a lot of inflammation in the ascending aorta unless you're in aortitis or, or in a different disease process. But um, we actually, what I was saying about that VSMC3 population, it actually ended up all being from one sample and it was an aortitis, it turned out, <laughs> we didn't know at the time, it was an aortitis sample that was kind of burned out. Um, and even the immune cells in the aortitis sample were vanishingly <laughs> rare um, because it was burned out, aortitis. But, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that's possible from, from the data we had. I mean, there, there were some macrophage um, DEGs, but they didn't make sense from the classic subset of macrophage. I mean, I, I think that's really hard to do with limited numbers. Okay. Uh, by single cell RNA sequencing, how similar are mouse models of aortic aneurysm to human patient samples? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead. You presented that a little bit, Dr. Lindsay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends on the type of aneurysmal disease. I, I, I think the Marfan mice are probably more similar to Marfan uh, syndrome. I, I don't think we have a good model of ascending thoracic disease in mice. Um, you know, we have proxies. But even the Marfan um, ascending aorta will attract a lot of monocytes and that's not something we see in human histology. And so I, I think you have to be careful um, with interpretations that, and I'll leave the abdominal aorta where that kind of biology is super important 
to, to Dr. Hay. Yeah, I mean, so far in the published literature, there's actually been, um, there's three typical models that are used within the um, well-accepted models of abdominal organism. There's the angiotensin II model that we typically use with our lab and the elastase model, the calcium chloride model. And each of those models, single cell sequencing data has been generated by different labs on each of those models. And comparing them to our single cell human data that we've generated from our aspects, there is similarities, definitely. Um, but no model fully recapitulates the human disease that we see from some of the single cell subsets. So I, I think it's, it's once again, um, just a translational um, difficulty that we as the scientists struggle with to try to have that model correlate over their human disease aspects of it. Our lab use the angiotensin model a lot. And uh, we do think uh, it is important to separate the non the alta without that section and the, and the alta with that section that the, the difference is very big and even in human tissue i'm glad uh, dr uh, lindsay showed that in aneurysm we don't see a lot of uh, 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 inflammation but in that section you can see the huge changes yeah, and nice. in aneurysm actually is more compensatory response like a, you you see the smooth muscle shifting from uh from more like contractile phenotype more towards fibroblast type. It's more like a, we we think this is probably part of the compensatory response. So I, it, it, overall, the model in between like a, a animal model with the, uh cons pretty consistent with the human samples. But like a, a animal model, you do see more compensatory response. This is our experience and uh, versus the, in the in the patient um, sample, it's more at the end stage of disease, and you see a lot of the, this compensation, more inflammation, and the more end stage of the uh, uh, phenotype change. So that's a bit different. So the, I, I think it's important that when you do the animal model to, if you have the dissection there, to separate uh, non dissected tissue with dissected tissue, because the difference is huge there. I am um, just to add a plug. I, I I did a GenTech webinar about a year ago on mouse modeling of aortic disease, and it, it's referenced on the website. So it, it that's my opinion on. I I made a bunch of slides on this topic and, and talked about it, um, but there's lots of different opinions. So people, you know, <laughs> I think Thank that's you. a great point about even within animals, you have to separate the. The issue. Great. And thank you for that plug, by the way. Uh, Dr. Davis, I know you were feverishly typing responses in the Q&A box. Is there anything that you'd like oh. to briefly call out? Um, I, I think I, I answered a lot of them in the Q&A box because I figured we might run short on time just to get everybody's questions addressed. I think there's one um one question I did want to call out just because if there's an ongoing clinical trial with abdominal organisms right now with metformin treatment and not metformin treatment. And an individual in the, the questions asked if we were able to separate our single cell sequencing data set into patients who were on metformin who were do not, and um, and they have any answers from that. And unfortunately, because of a power limitation, we were not. We did have patients that we had two patients that had were taking metformin, but we didn't feel confident enough in our results to report that from a power analysis of any reportable differences. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, many thanks to those in our audience who submitted questions and to our speakers for so thoroughly addressing them. I am going to just very quickly do uh, one quick plug for Gentech. Um, if that comes up, is it? Okay, there we go. So if you're not yet familiar with the Gentech Alliance, please check us out at gentechalliance.org and join our email list. Our webinar today will be posted to the site in the next week or two, and you can also check out past recordings like the one Dr. Lindsay mentioned, um, and lots of other great content. Again, many thanks to our speakers, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.